probably got negative. Okay, is awesome roadmap okay with everyone? Yes. Okay, brief off time roadmap. We're going to be doing definitions, two observations, and then our three contentions. Is everybody ready? Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. going to begin time now. The resolution that we are affirming today is that the United States federal government should impose substantial economic sanctions on the Democratic Republic of Congo. So just to do some quick definitions, substantial sh sanctions you're going to see in our mandate, but it is going to be a substantial increase from the status quo. Economic sanctions being commercial and financial penalties, such as trade barriers, tariffs, restrictions um, on the trade of that country imposed by another entity, and the Democratic Republic of Congo is the country of Congo. So with that, to go right into our plan, our mandate is for the IMF to stop working with and giving monetary aid to Congo. So this is a substantial increase as stated in the resolution because currently the IMF is the main source of the United States providing money to Congo as the United States votes through the IMF to have this money sent to Congo. The IMF has had a very substantial impact on Congo because recently, within the past 10 years, the IMF has been able to significantly reduce their increase, excuse me, their roads, education, as well as lessen their infant mortality, all through the economic assistance that they have provided to them. I'll take it up on my plan. Um, sure. So our agent of action is the United States federal government. Our agent of enforcement is the IMF. Um, our cost is essentially none, normal means to implement the plan, and our timeline is immediately. Um, I'll take your question. Yes. Uh, is the IMF a part of the United States federal government? And if it isn't, how are you referring? Okay, so the IMF is not directly a part of the United States federal government. Obviously, the United States federal government works through the IMF directly with the IMF to impose these sanctions on Congo. The United States federal government is not the most effective way of directly imposing the sanctions on Congo, as it is through the IMF that they do the majority of their work, meaning that it is still being acted by the United States federal government in the most substantially increased way. So with that, to go into our two observations. So first off, why the United States federal government in the first place should be involved in the Congo. So peacekeeping in Congo is an extremely important UN priority, and UN priorities lie very closely to the interests of the United States. The UN has its second largest peacekeeping mission currently in Congo, meaning that we want peace to be held in Congo as that is beneficial to the UN and hence directly to the United States. Secondly, at a very basic level, we do better when everyone does better. Congo is one of the poorest countries in the nation with extremely high rates of violence such as crime, sexual assault, etc. And they also are a country with extreme poverty. Most of the people there live on the equivalent of two American dollars per day, while at the same time we see an extremely corrupt government corrupting its people. And it is in the United States' interests for us to have decrease the amount of world poverty as well as, well as protect democracy abroad. I'll take it up on five time. I have a lot to get through. Um, so with that, to go right into our first contention, which is that of ending immediate violence. So the current problem in Congo is that the current president there is currently trying to hold on to his third term in office. However, the issue with that is, is that Congo only allows for presidents to have two terms in office. So what this president, this corrupt president is doing in order to push back the polls, he is not allowing any form of elections to happen, and that has led to huge uprisings within the people and very violent clashes in between the citizens and the police enforcing this president's policy. So in the last week alone, over 50 lives have been lost, according to The Guardian. Uh, so we see huge violations of human rights, as well as basic principles of democracy, not people not being allowed to vote and practice their basic democratic rights that matter so much to the United States and our interests. I'll take that 95 five time. Um, so the impact of this is that by imposing these sanctions, we can have an immediate end to this violence, which is extre extremely detrimental to this country. The senior analysis of the Enough Project said that sanctions are the most effective way to communicate with the Congo, as finances are the first and most effective place to hit this country. In order to get our point across, it is the simplest and most effective way to directly end the violence. Furthermore, the Human Rights Watch has asked the United States, the EU, and the UN to intervene immediately into the Congo in order to put an end to this violence. We're going to be upholding what the majority of the globe wants in order to substand um, peace abroad. So, and I'm going on to our second contention, which is the idea of ending dictatorship. So essentially, what is going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo? They're no longer a democratic republic. They're becoming more of a dictatorship. If the president is refusing to step down from office, refusing to let people vote and practice their basic democratic rights, they're no longer the kind of democracy that we want to be supporting abroad. And this is not only important in the short term, it is important in the long term in order to allow this country, which currently suffers from a variety of problems, to be able to grow and benefit in the future. And sanctions are the most effective way to send a message to its government that we're no longer going to be tolerating their behavior. 
Essentially, the Congo and its economy is entirely dependent on the donations of the United States and other big superpowers. As we previously said, one of the poorest countries in the world. If they no longer have this money coming in, the president is going to be forced to step down and to reconsider his actions and for allow the elections that the people so desperately want to happen. Um, Furthermore, we see that it's extremely important to end this dictatorship, dictatorship specifically because the entire time he has been in office, he has been extremely repressive of his people. We have seen that he arrests people in his opposing party. He promotes violence through his police force. For example, his police force would just simply go into the homes of people in the middle of the night, arrest them and kill them without any kind of warrant, due process, etc. So this president, even while he was an elected president, was extremely abusive of his citizens, which is why it's so key that he is not allowed to continue on to his illegal third term. I'll take your PY. You said that mainly what the IMF does is fund things like road construction, stopping infant mortality, etc. Considering that the Congo is struggling to the same extent that you talk about, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, why would we cut that from them? So that is, brings me perfectly into my third point, which is the idea of ending fraud and ending embezzlement happening within the um, Democratic Republic of Congo. So we see that the Democratic of Congo currently embezzles $15 billion a year. That is $15 billion a year that US taxpayers are paying in order to be able to support these people, as well as money that should be going to the starving citizens who are living off of those $2 a year. So the money, while the IMF primarily works with the things that you stated and I stated as well, that money isn't even getting to these sources. That is where a portion of the money ends up in the end result. Initially, it has to go through the hands of the government. If that $15 billion stops coming into the hands of the government, the $15 billion that they're embezzling, they're going to be forced to take action, which is extremely significant in sending a strong message to um, the government in order to end the violence and end the government um, imposing on them, as well as the fraud that we have been talking about. So simply to summarize our key points today, in the status quo within the last week alone, we see a very drastic change in the normal way of life in the Congo, the third um, election has been stopped and instead there is no voting, no polls, instead an imposition of a dictatorship. The immediate result of our plan is to end significant violence, which is an extreme benefit in terms of the status quo, immediate result of our plan. The second long-term effect of our plan is establishing democracy in the Congo, which is in American interest as well as interest in the Congo. And finally, we prove that our plan is going to work through ending fraud and having that $15 billion no longer being sent to the hands of this corrupt government. So for those reasons, we affirm. Okay, Theodore is going to be uh, the negative team's office positions, first dealing with sort of the framework of the round and the affirmative team's plan, and then dealing with our disadvantages to the plan, and then the affirmative team's own case in order. Is everyone ready? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, a huge congratulations to everyone for making it to the final round. Thank you to the judges for staying around. We are proud to negate today's, today's resolution that the United States federal government should impose substantial economic sanctions on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But unfortunately, before we can discuss the specific substantial merits of the case, we need to discuss our affirmative team's plan. Because our position is that the plan that they talk about actually does not affirm the resolution, which means they fail their most basic burden as the affirmative team. Let's look specifically at what the resolution says. The resolution says that the United States federal government should impose substantial economic sanctions. Now you note that the United States federal government includes only the branches of the United States own government and not international bodies that it deals with. So that's the legislative, judicial, executive branch, etc. But not the IMF. Now their plan, which specifically is that the IMF should end all of its dealings, might influence U.S. dealings with the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but that's not all it does. Because the IMF as an organization is multinational, includes almost every country in the world. It's not just the United States providing aid, it's, it's the UK, it's France, it's every other country providing aid through the IMF. And so the idea that the IMF funding is somehow the same thing as the United States funding is a bit of a fallacy. This means they fail the most, their most basic burden as the affirmative, because their plan needs to prove the resolution true. And when the resolution says United States federal government, and they decide they would rather like to debate about the IMF instead of the United States federal government, they are no longer affirming the resolution. So even if they could prove that IMF sanctions would be a good idea, the IMF is not the same thing as the United States federal government, and thus they have not proven the resolution true. This is important for a couple of reasons. First, it's critical to education, and second, it's critical to fairness in the round, because we prepared expecting them to talk about the United States federal government sanctions. 
So the fact that they come up and suddenly their case is about actually IMF sanctions instead means we're put in a position where we have less access to this debate, which never really means the debate is going to be lower quality, less educational, because they deny us access to being able to prepare for what kind of case they might be reading. So it's important that you vote on this issue because it's ultimately a question of whether they affirm the resolution or not. If their plan is about the IMF, that's nice, but the resolution didn't ask about the IMF, and thus they have not proven the resolution true, which means you can vote negative. That said, our first disadvantage is humanitarian aid. And currently, the United States is a critical provider of humanitarian aid, both through the, UN, through the IMF and through other organizations, for a number of different causes. Specifically, it's provided critical humanitarian aid to check for disease outbreaks, like the yellow fever, which has affected thousands of people in some specific provinces of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, both through the IMF and other organizations. Its total aid numbers almost a billion dollars, including about 500 million towards the UN mission, 300 million in general aid, and 100 million in emergency humanitarian aid. This is critical because in the aftermath of a conflict, US aid and IMF aid is one of the only things holding the, holding the country together and preventing groups like M23, which is only recently defeated, from returning to the field and engaging in more civil war for a conflict that only ended three years ago. The only thing that keeps these people from going back to war is the existence of viable economic prospects. And so if we destroy those prospects by destroying the aid that makes those prospects possible, and we plunge this country back into the economic darkness that it was originally in, that is only going to cause more war, more instability, and thus more death, both directly from disease and indirectly through increased conflict and instability, which would occur in a world of the affirmative. Second, however, sanctions empirically fail for a couple of reasons. First, other countries will always undercut the efficacy of the sanctions. For instance, the European Union is almost always opposed to sanctioning countries such as the Democratic Republic of the Congo because they view it as unjust for the reasons we talked about in our first disadvantage. So even if the United States cuts its aid, the European Union is still going to provide all of its aid. In addition, China and Russia view the DRC as a critical trading partner, which means if the United States pulls out, they're just going to fill in. There'll be no incentive for anything to change. Question? How do you account for the fact that last week the EU called for sanctions due to the increase in violence? The EU is calling for sanctions on officials, not sanctions on humanitarian aid. There's a difference between saying, you're responsible for a coup, we're cutting off your assets, and what the affirmative does, which is saying, we're going to deny access to road building and protections against infinite mortality and basic protections against infectious disease and hope that somehow that is going to resolve the political crisis in the Congo. But second, to be effective, sanctions need to be followed by neighboring countries as well. Specifically, the countries in the African Union and the countries in the region have no interest in following along with the program of sanctions that they are talking about, which ultimately means that there's no risk that their plan would do much of anything because these countries are simply going to fill in and not allow anything to happen. Let's move on to the affirmative case. So first, notice that when they talk about what the IMF is doing in this country, they talk about the IMF doing things like funding programs against infant mortality, things like building roads. None of those things have anything to do with the ongoing political crisis. The kinds of sanctions that could do something about the political crisis are targeted sanctions on particular politicians, particular generals, that are intended to force those generals to come to the table. Thankfully, we are already doing those kinds of sanctions. As of three days ago, the United States is already implementing targeted sanctions on top officials. So there's no need for additional sanctions, which would put no extra pressure, would have no impact on the officials on the top, and would only cost those in everyday life. There's no reason that we should punish everyday members of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, everyday citizens who are affected by infectious diseases, who are affected by war and poor economic prospects, just because we think that somehow the leader of the country is going to get a message from us punishing his poor citizens. Furthermore, they say that international groups love this, and that specifically international groups think that we need to sanction them and that sanctions are key. That's true, but the kinds of sanctions international groups want are sanctions on top generals, top politicians, like I said. No international group is calling for us to sanction basic humanitarian aid, things like roads, things like infant mortality, because they know that cutting those things is only going to cause more backlash and cause more anger. They talk a lot about dictatorship and the third term in office that Kabbalah is seeking and how this is anti-democratic, and we agree. But there's no reason that cutting off humanitarian aid, which is critical to simply stop disease, is ever going to cause him to change his behavior. Ultimately, there's no possibility for them to resolve the impacts they talk about. On the third, uh, on the third contention, they talk about ending fraud. They talk about how $15 billion is embezzled through the MI. There's just one problem for them, which is that $15 billion is more than the IMF gives this country every year. They've cited the wrong statistic. $15 billion is the amount of money embezzled by public servants in total. But the vast, vast majority of that funding is embezzled not through the IMF or international aid, but it's simply embezzled through the normal government budget and taxation of DRC citizens. In fact, IMF aid is often directly implemented, which bypasses the whole possibility of embezzlement. 
Furthermore, there's no reason that we should cut off critical aid, which is saving lives right now, and preventing things like yellow fever, just because we're afraid that theoretically it might find its way into the pockets of a public official. There's no reason that sanctioning humanitarian aid is effective. All it's going to do is shore up the position of the dictator, make it impossible for these people to gain access to the basic services they need, and do nothing to solve the problem. <laughs> um, so, as a quick off time, congratulations to my opponents. Once again, guys, congratulations for being here. Um, we know you guys worked incredibly hard, just as we did. And, um, yeah. Well, yeah, congratulations. Um, to everybody watching, thank you for coming. As we know that you guys probably have anything better to do on a Saturday night. Um, and it really does mean a lot to us that you guys are passionate enough uh, with the sport to hear our side of uh, current event topics. So with that, here's what I'm going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mention, um, I'm going to go into the affirmative case. I'm going to have, I'm going to list off the observations that we have on the refutations that my opponents gave, and then we believe this cross applies or directly, you know, pertains to their case as well. So if I have time, I will go into their case more specifically. We believe our observations will cover that um, just on our case. So with that, just out case, uh, just out case, and when time, uh, if time allows, that case. Um, yeah, okay, is everybody ready? Fantastic. With that, I would like to begin now. The United States federal government, their job is to uphold the values of the United States Constitution that benefits every single person in this room. The United States Constitution is something that makes the world a better place, our world a better place. Because of this, because of this constitutional value that our country holds, we have the burden to extend this to the rest of the world. We have the burden and the privilege of making sure that every other country on this earth has the ability to have a democratic political system, benefits for their population, and a high quality of life that our Constitution enshrines to us. So with the resolution that the United States federal government should increase sanctions, economic sanctions to be specific, on the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we strongly affirm. Now, within our plan text, the, our opponents made a comment saying that the plan does not affirm the resolution, how um, only the branches of the United States federal government is what it calls for, and therefore, since we don't enact that, we are not topical. However, the resolution, protected time, uh, I'll take it at the end of this thought. It's 539. I'll take it at the end of this thought then. Um, the resolution does not say solely the United States federal government, it just says the USFG needs to be an actor. Here's our justification for this. The judicial, uh, the judicial branch proves that represent, representation in the IMF is constitutional. The legislative branch votes that our presence in the, United, or in the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is necessary. And finally, our executive branch approves of this. Our United States federal government is the reason why we have representation in the IMF. So what we are doing here is we are extending the USFG and we are a major actor in the IMF, as I'm going to get to in a second. And the IMF is just our tool. Picture it like you need to make a, you need to make a box. And you use screwdrivers and nails in order to make it. You still control everything that box is made of. You still control the shape of that box. And you still are the creator of that box and the owner. That is our action in the IMF. Here's why. The United States has 17% voting power in the IMF. This is the highest amount of voting power by 10%. Next highest is about 6% voting power. We also have highest veto power within the IMF. So what this means is the United States federal government technically has complete control over actions that the IMF will implement. So because we have such a strong presence there, we can extend that the United States federal government, based off the observations I've already mentioned, has the ability to use the IMF to provide economic sanctions and aid to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Are there any questions? Yeah, of course. Uh, so you say that the United States has 17% voting power on the IMF. Yes, sir. I'll give you that that's a lot, but it just doesn't happen to be 51%. So what does the other 83% think about you deciding the IMF is just a branch of the U.S. government? That's a fantastic question. A 51% analogy only works when there are two actors. One is 49%, one is 51%. In the IMF, since so many different nations have voting power, 17% is that 51%. 17% is that 51% because we have strong veto power as well. So that 17% is so much greater than the next, uh, next uh, value of voting, which is six. Therefore, we have exponentially, we have exponentially more um, power than every other country. 
and is most likely and encouraged in 2010 when the IMF started this funding, um, that is doing good things. So other countries agree with us. So we have the ability to understand that based on previous historical examples, which I will list off in a second, um, other countries will agree, we have the ability to control the IMF, our veto power, make sure that we will implement any plan possible. That is my response to that. Going into our contentions, our first, excuse me, our first comment about ending violence. They say that economic sanctions don't stop political problems. They mentioned the status quo about sanctions put on political advisors, saying that we need to put sanctions on the officials. However, I have a couple observations against this. The status quo does not make life better for the people in the country. We already said that the IMF sanction, um, the quality of life, I should say, the IMF sanction that we were proposing in the past 2010 alone has uh, built 22,000 kilometers of road, increased infant life expectancy by 83%, and has also, in addition to that, uh, made the presence of education for kids in the country increase by 61%. Um, 61.4%. So what we see here is that when you do have the status quo of sanctions on the political advisors, it's not enough. What we need to do is we need to have these economic sanctions on the government so we can control where the money goes. Because as of right now, we have, or, uh, with the increased funding, we A, have the control of where the money goes, and B, we can make the quality of life, which is a constitutional value of the United States, um, apply to the people of the Congo. And since 80% of the Eastern population has evacuated due to prior civil war, the country's in ruins, and this is pertinent right here, right now. So the affirmation wins this debate because we are building things within the country that pertain to its success in the future. We have future solvency, they do not. They do not explain how in the future their plan makes it better. So, um, at the end of five time, I have a lot to get through because you guys do have a very compelling case that I would like to comment on. Um, so, they're, uh, they're moving on to their case and I would like to um, uh, move on to their to negations case. Uh, they have a couple observations, the first one being that we destroy aid with sanctions um, through uh, basically denying humanitarian aid. That is one big point they had. Uh, they did list off multiple statistics of this humanitarian aid. Um, and we have one big thing to respond to this with is that we turn this argument against them because I don't think that they understand truly what we are doing here. The economic sanction does not necessarily, in this case, based off of our definition of what an economic sanction is, um, we have the ability for the economic sanction, the commercial financial penalties, such as barriers, tariffs, and restrictions. We control where the money goes. The Western influence, or the IMF and Western and Eastern influences, mind you, um, have an ability to decide where this money goes. That is a restriction on the spending. And we also have the ability to give them that money. So we don't decrease any humanitarian aid at all. We A, keep it, and the IMF adopts it. So the IMF controls the fact that, um, the IMF controls the fact that this humanitarian aid is not necessarily being controlled in the status quo, and it will be in the future. And secondly, um, all the benefits that they listed from the humanitarian aid we adopt because the IMF makes sure that this is implemented. And as they stated, the fifteen billion dollars uh, last year that was embezzled, that was normal, uh, like normal GDP growth that was embezzled by officials doesn't happen in the future. Because the IMF presence will be greater within our plan. We are significantly increasing the amount of money that they're spending and their presence in this country. So we see that the, actually the NEG has no clash in this debate. Because um, as we stated in multiple science, sanctions don't include tariffs. They don't include, or our type of sanctions that we're offering, it doesn't include tariffs, it doesn't include the ending of humanitarian aid. So because of that, we actually don't see any clash in the debate today. The negation has not given you a reason why we don't solve for supplying, sorry, give you reasons why increasing economic sanctions on the Congo, um, why increasing economic sanctions on the Congo would not, would be a detrimental thing to society. We have given you reasons why it would actually help the Congo in the present and in the future. We've also given you compelling reasons why the negation does not solve for the future, why actually the affirmative is the case that you need to be taken into consideration when we look at the world as a whole. Because of the observations listed, we urge a very strong uh, argument um, and vote for the affirmation. Thank you, guys. Great. Is that ready? Yeah. Great. Time begins now. We once again strongly negate the resolution that the United States federal government should impose substantial economic sanctions on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I'll be going over our problems with their framework, then the negation case, and then the affirmative. But before I jump into that, we need to make a little observation on what my opponents have been doing in their last speech. Entirely changing their plan. Their plan in the first affirmative speech was that the IMF would stop working with US funding in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
They listed things that this IMF funding is currently doing and said that they would be stopping this as their form of economic sanction. In their last speech, they're talking about how they are the only ones who are going to be continuing this IMF funding, that the IMF is going to be getting more involved in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. First of all, changing your plan in the second speech is entirely abusive. It makes it so that my partner's entire speech would become irrelevant because he responded to a plan that was then just changed in the next speech. Not only that, but increasing IMF presence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is not an economic sanction by any definition of the term. Yes. Point of clarification, we were not saying that the IMF presence is going to be increased. We're saying that IMF humanitarian aid is not included within our definition of sanctions. Essentially, aid is not sanctions in our original Can you please definition. clarify your plan? Yes, the plan that we had, yes. So, okay, the mandate of our plan that I originally read is that the IMF stops working with Congo. However, it is common Perfect. knowledge Thank as you. brought right. up in our so Thank you. That is plenty. That the IMF will stop working with the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Any further clarification of this later is absolutely abusive as they did not say it in their plan anywhere. The IMF stops working with the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That ends this humanitarian aid. That ends the benefits they're talking about. That makes it much harder for the Democratic Republic of the Congo to ever recover from the current turmoil it's facing. Now to move on to our arguments as to why their plan doesn't actually affirm the resolution. First off, the fact that they keep arguing that the United States federal government has a lot of control in the IMF, and as such, the IMF is the United States federal government. Now, the United States government might have a lot of control over the IMF. That does not make the two entities the same thing. Just because the United States government has a lot of control in, for instance, the UN Security Council, does not mean they are the same entity. The United States federal government does not include the IMF. The IMF is not a subsidiary of the United States federal government. As such, when they say that the IMF should take this action, even if the United States government has to approve its participation, even if we have veto power, we are still not a majority of the IMF. We would particularly cite an example in 2010, when the rest of the IMF voted to overrule what the United States wanted in the case in favor of developing nations against particularly what the U.S. voted for. We see the IMF does not do the same thing as the U.S. government always wanted. They are not the same entity. As such, even if the IMF should get rid of this aid, should do their plan, which is a terrible idea as well, it is still not affirming the resolution. And as my partner said, for the reasons of education and fairness in today's round, because they are not on actually affirming the resolution, they cannot win today's round. But now to move on to the negation team's case. Our first point talking about that is humanitarian aid. Their only argument is that they control where this money goes and ensuring that we're going to actually help these people. However, first of all, their plan doesn't do that. Their plan says the IMF would stop working with the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Okay, so they stop what they're doing in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. What they're doing there right now is things such as humanitarian aid. Logically, that means they stop this type of humanitarian aid that we're speaking of. Things that help fight disease, things that are helping to hold this country together in the wake of the Civil War that only ended only three years ago. My opponents are not helping humanitarian aid, but only making it worse. And if they're trying to say they're helping humanitarian aid, they're not having economic sanctions. Because economic sanctions don't do that in any way. On our second point about how sanctions fail, they make absolutely no response. Empirically, sanctions do not work and will not work in this situation, first of all, because other nations are against it, such as Europe, such as China, such as Russia, as well as neighboring countries have no interest in fulfilling these different things, which means they absolutely will fail. Now to move on to the affirmative case. First of all, they make an argument about how they're upholding the U.S. Constitution. Now it doesn't strike me as very important to uphold democracy if we're letting everyone die. Now, by ending humanitarian aid, by targeting the people instead of the officials that we are doing right now, we are only making it harder for these people to survive and harder for their country to recover from the problems they are facing right now. It is not moral to take away the aid to the people in the name of trying to stop government corruption. Now, to move on to their first point, talking about how it's ending violence. We talked about how right now there's absolutely no reason that um, stopping humanitarian aid would ever change anything. They only make the argument the status quo isn't helping people. And then they go on to list how the IMF is helping to build roads, has reduced infant mortality, has done all of these great things. And we agree, the IMF has done really great things. That's why we shouldn't stop this form of humanitarian aid. The way we are pressuring the government right now, a way that I will point out was started three days ago, and as such has had no time to take effect, 
is to sanction top officials. We cannot judge after three days that it has been entirely ineffective and we should now just take away all the humanitarian aid that is keeping most of these people alive. Their plan would not in any way ensure that this aid helps to end violence, that it helps, to, helps more people or anything. They are not stopping dictatorship. They are not ending violence. They are making it harder for everyday people to live their lives and making it less likely that we'll see any sort of solution in the future. On their third point about ending fraud, my partner brought up how, first of all, this $15 billion is the total amount of money that is embezzled, most of this through normal government mechanisms, and that the IMF directly implements aid to the people. Again, they make absolutely no response to this. And the fact that the IMF aid is not getting embezzled directly. This embezzlement is the overall government doing bad things. And we agree, the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is not doing a good job for its people. Which is why we should trust in the sanctions implemented three days ago on top officials that actually target the people causing the problem instead of targeting the people who are being negatively affected by the problem. And because their plan, first of all, changed in this speech in an extremely abusive way, never affirmed the resolution to begin with, and definitely doesn't now, and even if you buy their plan, will only hurt more people, we are proud to negate this resolution. Everyone ready? Well. Uh, I think this has gotten to be a pretty confusing debate, so I thought we might want to start by reminding ourselves what it is the plan is that we're debating. And the plan that they said they read is that the IMF should stop working with the Congo. I don't know what they think that means, but in reality, when the IMF stops working with the country, that means no aid, that means no road building, that means no basic prevention against diseases, no basic prevention against things like yellow fever that we mentioned. I don't know what they think would happen if the IMF stops working with the Congo, but that doesn't mean they get to pick more carefully who the aid goes to. That doesn't mean they get to make sure it doesn't get embezzled. That means the aid never shows up in the first place. This means it's critical to negate, because it's critical to preserve the aid that is currently holding a country that is only a few years out of a civil war, only a few years out of a bruising conflict that its state barely recovered from. It's crucial to preserve that country's unity, and the only way to do that, the only way to hold together the stability of the Congo, is through the aid that their plan would cut. Because if the IMF stops working in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, that's it. They're not coming back, they're not doing this aid. And so ultimately, it's critical to negate because that maintains access to all of the aid that people need to hold the country together. But our first voting issue has to do with nothing of that, and it's simply that they do not affirm the resolution. I don't think I'm the only one who was a little surprised when the topic said the United States federal government should sanction this country, and then they got up and said the IMF should do it. Because even if the IMF is an institution the United States has a lot of influence in, even if the United States entirely controls the IMF, which it doesn't, the IMF is not the same thing as the United States federal government. It's in the name, International Monetary Fund. That's why there are hundreds of other countries that are members of the International Monetary Fund that vote, that contribute funds, and the United States is only one small part of that. And so the idea that somehow the IMF doing things is the same thing as the United States doing things is just grammatically absurd. This is critical because they have conceded that this is a prior issue before you evaluate the rest of the debate. It doesn't matter how good of an idea it is for the IMF to sanction the Democratic Republic of the Congo if the IMF is not the USFG, because the burden of the affirmative is to prove the resolution true, and the resolution says that the United States federal government should impose sanctions. And so at the point where they have conceded that the IMF is not the same thing as the United States federal government, they have not proven the resolution true. And you can vote negative right now without looking at the rest of the debate. That said, even if you do, I think we're pretty clearly winning the rest of the flow. My second voting issue is the issue of humanitarian aid, and the issue of IMF aid that would be lost if the IMF stopped working in the Congo, as their plan text says. They have conceded that IMF aid is critical to stop a number of ongoing disease outbreaks, like the 1,800 people that have currently been reported to have yellow fever, who need basic aid, who need basic kinds of health care, etc., that can only be provided by groups like the United States, groups like the IMF. And they have conceded that in a world where the IMF stops working in the Congo, that means that not only will United States aid be lost, IMF aid will be lost. That makes it difficult to solve for ongoing cases of disease. And furthermore, it makes it difficult to solve for the ongoing civil strife which would be caused by a, by a return to the lack of economic prospects that they had in the past. 
My entire argument in the LSC was that the reason the Democratic Republic of the Congo was able to end its civil war was because of smart, targeted economic aid that creates opportunities for people and allows them to have options other than joining a guerrilla force, options other than going to war. If those economic opportunities disappear, that means the country descends back into the chaos that it returned from. And we see violence unlike anything that is currently happening. The only way to prevent that is to maintain the aid which we currently have, which means you must negate. Because if the IMF stops working with the Congo, Congo's temporary stability at the moment is at risk. The possibility of future conflict emerging would be very real. We do not believe that is worth the risk. But third, and finally, this would do nothing to change the political situation. It's telling that the second affirmative doesn't talk at all about the actual issue that they were talking about in their entire first speech, which is the question of what can we do about the current president of the Congo. And the reason for that is because we are already doing the things that we can most effectively do to make the president of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Joseph Kabbala, step down. We are imposing sanctions on both him and his closest officials. We are imposing international pressure on the people who are actually responsible for this crisis. And since it's only been three days, as my partner said, we have no reason to believe that those sanctions won't work if we give them enough time. Adding additional sanctions, whose only impact would be to reduce access to humanitarian aid for people at the bottom of Congolese society to reduce access to humanitarian aid for the people who need that aid the most and who need that aid to survive, to avoid infectious diseases, and to have the basic economic prospect to climb out of the terrible poverty they talk about is not going to do anything to change that. This is not going to cause a shift in, in Congolese politics. The president of the Congo is not going to step down because he made a bunch of his citizens starve. All you're going to do is cause new death, new destruction, and a new return to the chaos of the past. We believe that is not worth the cost, and we believe that in addition to that, their plan does not affirm the resolution, and you should probably punish them for changing their plan. Make sure they can do it again. I'm going to do a couple observations about the definitions, then I'm going to go into voting issues. Okay, so working to, I'm going to begin my time now. Um, so essentially, I just want to re-clarify some of the definitions. When we talk about sanctions in my very first speech, beginning of the debate, we said that sanctions are the limitation of commercial and financial penalties, including things such as barriers, tariffs, etc. Nowhere in this definition was humanitarian aid included as a part of economic sanctions. This was not said in my definition. This point was brought up by my partner, and I'm going to say it again. Neither in my definition, definition, neither in the real world, real world application of economic sanctions is humanitarian aid included as a part of sanctions. We see that even in war-stricken countries, places where the U.S. is not sending its support, for example, to support a civil war, etc., humanitarian aid, the Red Cross, etc., is still able to get to these countries and support these people. Point this is the first time you've explicitly argued that any reduction in humanitarian aid would not be an example of a sanction, which is especially interesting since your plan involves cutting humanitarian aid, and thus, according to that definition, probably is Responding to your point of order, that is exactly what my partner said in his speech, as well as that is the point of information that I asked in your partner's speech about how the humanitarian aid is not a part of the economic sanctions. That point has been made by our team at least twice, but it's up to the judge's discretion. Judge's discretion. You're not Okay. So continuing on with the debate, I'm going to continue with the fact that humanitarian aid has never been included under economic sanctions, and that main point, asking you to trust the affirmation on this, brings down the entirety of the case of the negation because all of their points rely on the fact single-handedly that we're going to be cutting humanitarian aid. Because humanitarian aid is not being cut as a part of economic sanctions, not our definition, not the real world definition, inherently their entire case falls as originally brought up to you by my partner. But I'm going to be explaining to you how even if you buy their argument about humanitarian aid, the affirmation still has the opportunity to win in a little bit. Um, so yeah, their other definitional point was the idea about how the IMF is not the United States federal government. Obviously, we know that two, two entities are entirely different. However, as to the resolution, the United States federal government should impose. Yes, the United States federal government is going to be imposing these sanctions through the means of working with another organization. The United States federal government is still the one doing this action. However, they are doing it through the IMF. This point has been said by the affirmation throughout the entirety of the debate. We talked to you about how the, um, the United States holds 70% of the voting power in the IMF the greatest voting power of any country, essentially has the majority of the say as to what um, the IMF does. Furthermore, we know that the UN and the EU also wanted to impose sanctions on Congo, meaning that not only the US, but two other very prominent um, entities are in agreement with the US about imposing these sanctions. It is whatsoever not problematic for the IMF to do this, and we have proven to you directly how it happens through the hands of the United States federal government. 
So that, I want to bring you into our first, first voting issue, which is the idea of success chances. So even if you've been buying their argument about humanitarian aid, worst case scenario, money isn't going to anyone. It's not going to the government, and it's not going to the people. But think about it, there is a lot less people in the government than there are in the people. Eventually, the money is going to run out in the government, and the people are going to be able to regain their powers of democracy and get the election that we've been talking about since the very beginning. The government is going to suffer before Wait, the people do. Any sort of argument about how the run money would run out in the government first, and as such, this would spur political change, is entirely new coming out of the last speech. Um, response to that, this is not a new argument. It is analysis of the fact that I'm talking about the success, cha success change chances, excuse me, in terms of the affirmation plan versus litigation plan, but again, up to the judge's discretion if that's okay with everyone. Okay. Yeah? Okay. So further continuing my time. So let's imagine, worst case scenario of the AF, nobody's getting any money. What I'm saying is this essentially is going to mean more power to the people in the end. But let's say you adopt the negations plan, we don't do anything in terms of sanctions, we stick with the status quo. That means that all of the problems I brought up to you in my very first speech, we're not putting any kind of end to them. The significant violence that resulted in 50 people dying last week alone is only going to continue and only going to get worse unless something is done to stop it. The ideas of this dictatorship, nothing is going to be done to stop the dictatorship. The election, never going to happen. A new president in office, never going to happen. The people are going to have to continue violently protesting and lo losing their lives over a very basic democratic right and value that they have, as well as the idea of fraud happening and the $15 billion that they agree to are being embezzled as a whole is still going to continue happening, and no benefit is ever going to happen to um, the people of Pop Congo. So the weighing mechanism that we decided on upon the origins of today's debate was net benefits. So you see that on the side of the negation, they're not bringing anything new to the table. They're not solving the problem in any way, shape, or form. The violence is going to continue happening. The corrupt government is going to continue happening. So what I'm trying to say is, even if you've been buying the point about humanitarian aid on the side of the affirmation, these benefits may not happen in the ideal way, but they're still going to happen eventually. On the negation, nothing happens, and you're sticking with the side of the status quo. However, if you are um, believing my original line of argumentation, which I hope you are, humanitarian aid isn't even included in this original definition. Because humanitarian aid is not included in the definition of economic sanctions, every single one of their point falls. Their point about humanitarian aid has fallen. Their point about how other countries don't want sanctions has fallen. As well as their point about sanctioning on officials and how the IMF aid doesn't include, um, doesn't include these sanctions, etc. All of that relies on the fact as they have been arguing that humanitarian aid is economic sanctions, but we know that simply that is not the case, that is not factually true, and it is not true in the scope of today's debate. So because either way, in either case scenario, the affirmation is the only one providing the net benefits that we talked about originally in today's debate, which is a very strong vote for the affirmation. Thank you.